Good morning and good evening, everyone, depending on where you're joining us from. Welcome to the chat GPT. How will the next generation of AI systems shape business, society, and employment webinar? I'm Geraldine E, Senior Editor at Insight Knowledge, and I'll be your host for today. Today's webinar is part of the Tech Talk X series by Digital at INSEAD, which is dedicated to exploring new digital technologies, the applications, as well as the impact on management, business, and society. For more information, please visit the Digital at INSEAD website. Before we begin, we'd also like to thank our sponsor, Accenture. Today, we have with us very distinguished speakers. I'd like to introduce them. First, we have Theos Afternew, Professor of, Digital, Professor of Decision Sciences and Technology Management at INSEAD and Co-Director of the INSEAD Executive Education Program on Transforming Your Business with AI. Theos has been working on machine learning and AI for the past 25 years on areas including AI innovation for business process optimization and improving decisions, AI regulations, as well as new machine learning methods. We have Morten Olsen, Associate Professor in the Department of Economics at the University of Copenhagen, where he works in the field of economic growth and international economics. His current research focuses on quantifying new automation technology using text analysis of patents. He uses these measures to estimate the drivers and consequences of new automation technology. Finally, we have Panish Puranam, Professor of Strategy and the Roland Berger Chat Professor of Strategy and Organization Design at INSEAD. He, together with Theos, co-directs the Transforming Your Business with AI Executive Education Program at INSEAD. His recent work focuses on different ways in which intel intelligent algorithms relate to organizations in their roles as tools and members beside the traditional use as models. So we can expect a very interesting webinar today. But first, before we start off, we'd like to get a sense of how well acquainted everyone is with ChatGPT. So we have a poll. Can we have the poll questions? Right, so you see it now. Um, the question is very simple. Have you used ChatGPT? And the options are yes, no, and I don't intend to, or no, but I intend to. So let's get a sense, how much has everyone been engaging with ChatGPT? And in the meantime, I'd like to ask all our panelists to turn on your camera so everyone can see you. Thank you. All right, so 66% 66, 66 of our audience here have used ChatGPT. A very small percent are not going to use it, and maybe they will after this. Um, and 30% say they know they don't, they don't intend to. So let's hear from the experts. Um, what is ChatGPT and how does it work? So we'd like to first invite Panish to give us an explanation. What is this new technology really about? Panish, please. Sure. So ChatGPT is a particular product. The GPT stands for Generative Pre-Trained Transformer. Um, it's a particular product which belongs to a class of technologies called large language models. So you'll hear this phrase LLMs quite often as well in this context. And this, in, in turn, is a subset of machine learning. And machine learning, as by now everybody knows, is a particular kind of AI. Now, the reason I'm giving you this hierarchical structure is because, like all machine learning, ChatGPT also does basically one thing, which is it looks at a large amount of data, finds patterns in those, and then uses those patterns to make predictions. Okay? In the particular case of ChatGPT, the prediction it's making is, given the text you input, what's the output text that's most likely to be useful to you? So I don't know if you remember this from high school, but if you've done those exams where you see a series of pictures, first a star, then a triangle, then a circle, then again a star, then a triangle, and the question is what comes next, right? That's exactly how all machine learning works. There's more bells and whistles, but that's the core of it. And ChatGPT is no different. So it's a generative machine learning algorithm because it generates text trying to predict what it is you would like to see, right? Given what you have input. It's pre-trained. That's why we call it a GPT. It's a pre-trained machine. What it's doing is looking at a large corpus of text. In the case of chat GPT, it's everything up to September 21 in the web, plus a bunch of corpus for books and stuff. Uh, and finally, the particular algorithm that's being used to train it is called a transformer. Now, this is worth mentioning because a transform is a transformer is a particularly complicated kind of machine learning algorithm. The one beneath chat GPT is estimated to have something like um, 175 billion parameters and GPT-4 is expected to have or is rumored to have, we don't know for sure, something like 170 trillion parameters. Okay, So essentially what this is, is a very complex machine learning algorithm which finds patterns in text 
and uses that to make predictions about the kind of text you are likely to find useful given the prompt you put in. Theos, you want to add to that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I'll just add a couple of uh, things that are developing as we speak. Uh, first of all, it's important to understand that uh, ChatGPT is what some people recently start calling a foundation model. Foundation models is basically a model that can be used for different downstream applications. So by itself, ChatGPT is not exactly a product, but it can be used for multiple other products using what's called fine tuning. Uh, it's worth uh, searching online about what foundation models uh, are and what they mean. The second thing is that what we are seeing now a lot of focus of research on is what's called um, reinforcement learning from human feedback, RLHF. And then the idea is how can the machine learning algorithms take into account human feedback about how much we like or not like what it generates in order to improve? And what's fascinating here, and I'll stop there, is that there is already a lot of discussion and research in the labs as we speak regarding how to use human feedback to kind of solve an early version of what has been known for decades as the AI alignment problem, to make sure that the whatever ChatGPT generates is aligned with the values of the humans based on the feedback people give. That's why it's called reinforcement learning with human feedback. And that's where things are going towards. But it's important to keep in mind that this is a foundation model that can be used for many different downstream products. Thank you. Thank you, Theos and Panish. So the very important question that I think many of our audience members are interested in is what are the implications for business? How will business processes and decision-making change with ChatGPT? Um, Walter, would you like to start with this question? Uh, sure. Let me just sort of uh, set the stage. So any type of technology is going to have two types of effects. There's going to be a productivity effect and there's going to be some sort of substitution effect. Some people might lose their job, make less and so on. And if we sort of look over the long horizon, we've seen a productivity growth over, say, 200 years of something like 1.5 to 2% uh, every year over the long horizon. But this does not come smoothly. So in some periods, it grows faster than in other periods. And often, this is associated with what we call general purpose technology, also somewhat confusingly abbreviated as GPT. Uh, so you want to think here the steam engine, you want to think electricity, you want to think computers or something like that. And so typically when we have one of these, there's going to be a growth in productivity afterwards. So we saw that in the 90s and the early 2000s. But the thing is, over the last 10 or 15 years, we've had a markedly, a remarkably slower productivity growth in rich countries. So now we're talking something like 1% instead of, uh, instead of something like 2%. So the big hope here is that not just language models, but AI more generally will sort of be the next general purpose uh, technology. A fun thing. <laughs> about these general purpose technologies is that it actually takes a while before they start, before you can see them in the productivity uh, statistics. So there's this sort of quip by a prominent economist, Robert Solow, uh, from the 80s, that you can see computers everywhere, but in the productivity uh, statistics, because they were implemented in the 80s, but it wasn't really until the 90s that we started seeing uh, these things. And I would expect it to be something similar with AI. It's not trivial to implement these things. It takes a while to figure out how can you do things more productively with uh, with these things? So uh, I think a big unknown here is how is it going to improve uh, productivity? And I can sort of think about immediate cases. So I already use it for programming. I write in words what I'm going to do, and then ChatGPT basically uh, gives me a program code. Uh, you can imagine sort of synthesizing large documents, say in law, relatively simply as well. But the but how businesses are going to use this in five or ten years, I think, remains an unknown. Uh, do you want to add to that, uh, Fanish? Sure. Um, so <clears throat> very practically, I see three big use cases. So one is around copywriting and copy and text summarization. The second is around translation, <clears throat> including into programming languages. So I can say in English what I want, and I can get R code or Python code for it. And the third is search, which is to actually troll through the corpus and come up with answers. Of the three, I am least confident about the third. So at this point, it remains quite unclear whether you should trust the answers that these technologies come up with as being accurate, right? Uh, so anything where you can verify pretty quickly if it's correct, go ahead. So that includes writing copy, that includes summarization that you can check immediately, that includes translation into code, which either works or doesn't work. It, right? of course, includes translation into foreign languages as well. And of course, you can think about applications of that in marketing, with customer interaction, with copywriting, in legal, with giving a summary of a legal document, for instance, in operations for creating checklists, for instance, uh, in finance for writing summaries. So there's really a number of different functional applications of this. 
And we are already seeing a lot of those experiments taking place right now. Let me add to this. Um, first of all, going back to Morton, what you said, um, one of the most um, important um, lessons regarding uh, adoption of technologies in general in organizations, which goes all the way back to industrial revolution kind of technologies, not just uh, digital technologies, is that um, uh, the value and the challenges come from the organizational changes needed to implement uh, successfully these technologies and get value out of it. That's the first thing. Second thing, um, there is a specific industry, first of all, that really is affected by this um, to begin with, which is all online platforms. Um, uh, I've been talking with a bunch of them, and uh, one of the things that quote unquote they freak out with is like the massive volume ChatGPT can create for them to be able to moderate. This talks, uh, relates to content moderation and online trust and safety. So there's already a specific issue over there. We'll come back to this later when we talk about risks. Then adding to what uh, Fanny said, there are lots of simple tasks, and this relates to what I mentioned before about foundation models. This is a foundation model that now companies are developing products, downstream products based on downstream products like completion of a sentence, completion of a paragraph, uh, you know, summaries and what uh, things that Martin and the Fanny mentioned. So these simple tasks. However, what's interesting also, I think, is how this technology can affect creative jobs. For example, already some companies, I believe Coca-Cola is one of them, is using ChatGPT as part of their marketing and advertisement campaigns. Right. So how can it affect creativity? However, we have to be careful here regarding, as Fanny said, the, the validity of the output. And that's why some of the um, arguments made recently regarding the use of ChatGPT um, kind of uh, uh, go along the following lines, that it's important that the humans using these technologies already know something about it. So there are partial experts that are good enough, which reminds me of the well, well-known Kasparov law. Maybe, maybe some of you have heard years ago from Kasparov, the chess player, who wrote this uh, wonderful book, Deep Thinking, which basically goes as follows, more or less. Human, in this case, a good enough human, otherwise it's dangerous, plus AI, plus a strong process of how the humans and the machines work together, and we'll come back to this again, is much better than any of the AI and humans by themselves or any other variations. Um, finally, just um, regarding a business implication, we'll come back to this later from, from the risk point of view. Maybe there will be implications regarding how companies will use ChatGPT in order to ensure it's productively used, but safely. For example, should they put in place guidelines on how ChatGPT is used? Should there be transparency on when it's used? Should people be allowed to use it to begin with? But we'll come back to this later. Yeah. Thank you, Theos. Uh, thank you for the responses. So there has already been some questions in the Q&A, and um, I see some anxiety here. Some people asking about whether we play some jobs. So we'd like to get um, everyone's sentiments um, on ChatGPT. So could we have a second poll? And the question is, how do you feel about ChatGPT? Uh, can I ask uh, Fanish a follow-up question while we do the poll? Sure, of course. So ChatGPT is sort of uh, remarkably bad at math and logic uh, in the sense that it can even like get wrong whether 64 is bigger than 46 and so on. Mm -hmm. And I've heard that it should be possible to combine, combine it with one of the many computer programs that we have that can do these things, say Mathematica or Mabel or something like that. Does that sound as trivial as some people uh, make it sound like? Like, is it something that should just be possible? I mean, technically it is, but I don't think the APIs are set up right now to make that very easy, right? So partly it is this point Theos was making earlier. This is a foundational model. So there will be yeah. particular applications where people will find ways to integrate the outcome. And for example, explain a expression or a graph in plain English. This is all doable, I think, but it's not as of today, kind of a ready-made application. I have an important point to add here. I think it's important we understand that there is no reason ChatGPT should be able to do math. ChatGPT has well, learned the structure of language. That's not the same as the structure yes. of math. Therefore, no, 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 so the, math yes. means nothing. It means nothing regarding the ability of ChatGPT. Absolutely, um, absolutely. But, the, but no, go on. But the question well, is how good it will be. Because, because people, because, um, and I understand that's, that relates to your question. It's not exactly what you asked. But basically, it's important to understand what ChatGPT has learned, as Fanny said and what it has not learned because it was not in the data. Yes. And what's interesting, just to add to what you said, Morten, there is lots of research for a few years now in machine learning and AI regarding how to put together machine le statistical machine learning. By the way, this is statistical machine learning methodology. That's why it's probabilistic also in what it generates. Every time you ask it something, it can generate different answers probabilistically versus, uh, let's say, um, logic-based AI and machine learning. 
and how to combine the two and even use machine learning to prove mathematical theorems, which already works, by the way, fantastically well. So there is lots of progress to be done in using machine learning plus logic in a combined way to achieve all those things that you mentioned. Yeah. Let's see the results point. of the poll. Yeah, let's go back point. to the poll. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, I hope most people have managed to answer to the poll. Um, so 30% are extremely excited, 40% are hopeful, 17% neutral, 2% are extremely worried, and 11% are apprehensive. Right. So this is more positive than I imagined it would be. Uh, all the really worried people are not even here. <laughs> let's, yeah. let's, 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 let's scare everybody off a little bit. Yes. <laughs> Okay, so now we go to the next question, um, the economic implications. So what does the huge potential for automation mean for employment and productivity? So this in relation yeah. to the poll, pretty much anxiety. So, 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 there's, so there's, should we be scared of AI? So let me split th this up into two because there's sort of two words about AI. There's the one that uh, Theo has talked about very briefly before about al alignment, whether we risk these, uh, these systems doing something that we didn't intend them to do. Let me sort of put that aside yeah. and just think about AI as a new productivity pro uh, product and then think about uh, the next five or 10 years. Because as I said before, any new technology is gonna have a productivity effect and it's gonna have some sort of redistribution effect. And that can be very different in different time periods. So for instance, in the 1850s, new technology came in and it replaced skilled artisans that had spent 10 years learning how to make great shoes with machines and unskilled people basically being brought in from the countryside. So we call technology at this time, it's unskilled bias. It helped those that are unskilled. And you can have different time periods in which the effect is different, right? Automation of the factory floors is sort of more in favor of those who've gone to uh, university and so on. And a lot of what has happened from the 1980s and up until 2000 and say 10s, we think of skilled bias technical change in the sense that computers and so on disproportionately favored those who, uh, who have skills that complement the computers and disfavored other people. Think the secretary, think the mid-level accountant and, uh, and so on. So the big question is whether AI is gonna have one effect or the other. Is it gonna help one group of people or another group of people? So there's sort of two ways of thinking about that. One is in terms of the unemployment thing, whether technological unemployment uh, is, going to, uh, is going to arise. People have been worried about that for 150 years. With sort of a small nuance, we haven't seen any of this. So the big thing here would be something like uh, income inequality effects. And I think, unfortunately, we don't really know, right? I can tell a story of which a lawyer being paid 250000 a year might, to some extent, be replaced by chat GPT or systems like it. But I can also tell a story in which AI might replace uh, the cab driver um, in the uh, in the street, a lower a lower earning pe per, uh, person. There's little tendency if we sort of try and estimate what these things. There's little relationship between what do we think AI will be able to replace in an occupation and what is sort of the income level of that occupation. Unlike, for for instance, computers, which had a particular effect in the middle of the skill and distribution. Um, so I don't think over the next five or ten years it will create massive unemployment. Whether this is going to increase income inequality or not, at least sort of in the broad aspect of the population, that remains to be seen, but I, I don't see any particular signs that it will. You have something to add to this, Panish? I have to say, I'm, I'm, I tend to be a little bit more pessimistic, okay? The reason being that, um, firstly, I, I agree with Morton, we don't really know because all technologies in hindsight, many of the ones we've looked at seem to have done okay for us. This one is different in the very basic sense that in the past, when one technological change happened, the displaced labor usually found opportunities in other domains, which sprang up, mm -hmm. right? But a lot of that other domain springing up stuff depends on human ingenuity. And now we're talking about a technology that can substitute for human ingenuity, right? Also the retraining costs, I think are significantly different with this technology compared to the other ones. I would be wrong, right? But I think this is one of those problems where being wrong doesn't have the same cost in both directions. So I'd rather be wrong in a pessimistic way than be wrong in an optimistic way. Oh, I so that's regulation is going to be yes. important. So regulation so is going to be I, very important is basically what I'm saying. Yeah, Martin. Yes, but so so if you're, let's think about someone who might have been replaced by computer technology in the 90s or something like that. You can think about them going in two different directions. So you can think about what you implicitly thought here, that they sort of move up the skill ladder into something creative. So they become a marketing director or something like that. But there's also a bunch of people who move down in the other end. So they start working in right. retirement homes, uh, sweaters, yoga instructors, and so on. And it's going to be a while before AI 
uh, can replace people who are, say, working in a restaurant or who are working in retirement. So it's so so called sort of social uh, service jobs. Mm -hmm. um, now, that's not obviously not necessarily good for income inequality, right? You don't want to have too much of an increase in the amount of people who, who will work in these things um, because that's going to have a, a downward pressure on on wages. Uh, so, I, so I agree with the I agree with the potential sentiment um, and and the worry, but it's not something that's immediately clear that that's gonna that that's gonna happen. Let me let me take a very optimistic view, and um, okay, I, I, I like to think of, about AI mostly as augmented intelligence. So it's not about replacing, but augmenting people. And I think with these technologies, much like with any technologies in human history they will augment human ingenuity and creativity and we will be able to do things and generate new needs. Think about the products are generating needs we didn't even know about before, right? In a much faster pace than ever before. Now, I exaggerate here a little bit, but I think it's important to think about this as augmentations in addition to replacements. And so, but, uh, oh, no, go on. Yes, but just, just saying that it augments doesn't necessarily mean that there aren't going to be a negative consequences, right? So That's think right. about a law firm right now, right? So uh, the head lawyer might have three junior attorneys working for him who prepare the briefs, they read the documents and so on. If we augment him, the head lawyer, such that he can have ChatGPT replace one, two, or three of these people, then that's going to make him more productive, much more productive. But that might mean that the firm doesn't need as many lawyers. And then the, the further down the skill distribution within law, we we'll then have to find something else to do. My argument is a bit different. My argument is augmentation will lead to new innovations, not at the job mm -hmm. specific level, like you say, but other yes. people will come up with new ideas and products that we have not even imagined before. And that, of yes. course, will create new companies, new jobs, new markets, new products, new everything. And yes. I generally, I tend to be a technological op optimist, although we'll, talk quickly talk, we'll soon talk about risks where you know, I'm very cautiously optimistic, let's say. So do we have time to add one more point here, Geraldine? Yeah, I think sure. it's kind of important from a company perspective. So yeah. I think both Theos and Morton have been talking about the economy level, the overall effects, which is absolutely right. In companies, there's one additional twist to bear in mind. It can be very tempting to automate some of the lower end work because these technologies allow us to do it now. But the point is you're also developing talent for the next generation. So in many jobs, in many professions, you can't be a partner without having been an associate. You can't be a full professor without having been a research assistant, right? Yeah. So if you outsource or automate the low end, you kill your own talent pipeline. So that's something I think people can be at risk of being myopic about. And I just want to flag that. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Thank you. So now we move on to the social implications. Um, we have talked quite a bit about risk. So what are kind what kinds of risks might these technologies create and how can we manage these risks? Yeah, so I'll like be pessimist. <laughs> not be pessimist. You're the optimist. Uh, I'm an optimist, yeah, that's true, but I cautiously optimist. Let me start with um, something I, that was in the new last in news last week or so regarding China putting controls and even potentially banning the use of chat GPT and LLMs because of fears of propaganda, misinformation, you call it whatever you like. Now, this says a lot, and question mark for the audience, is AI and ChatGPT, which aggregates across different websites, which you could normally ban with a firewall, right? The well-known great firewall, or firewalls com countries may, may, may put, or companies. But you can do this by blocking websites, but how can you block ChatGPT that aggregates across websites? Is ChatGPT a Trojan horse behind great firewalls? Question mark. Which can be a a, a potential challenge for certain political systems. At the same time, it can be a potential challenge for democracy itself because of misinformation. That's the first point. Second point is related to misinformation, the idea of trust and safety. There has been a lot of um, different names regarding ethical AI, responsible AI, trustworthy AI. What I like very much myself um, as a term is um, a little bit borrowed from online trust and safety, what one can call tech trust and safety. And now here's very important. Trust is important for adoption, but trust can actually end up making a technology unsafe. Because I trust AI, because for whatever reason, I may end up following what it says and do something unsafe. So it's important to differentiate between trust and safety. And we have an article, um, I posted actually on LinkedIn last night, for those of you interested, if you go to my LinkedIn post, I posted a list of articles related to our webinar today. And one of them is a science magazine article we wrote um, a year ago or so regarding the challenge, the, the, uh, it's called Beware of AI Explainability, where we outlined a bunch of arguments regarding the, the difference between trust and safety. But we want both trust and safety. 
Sec a third thing is regarding um, malpractice. And this is some work as we speak, as well yesterday we worked on this with uh, my co-authors from Harvard Law School and London School of Economics regarding ChatGPT and regulations and how it can have an impact on potential new risks of professionals, for example, doctors, lawyers, you know, architects, you name it, right? What if any of the professionals using ChatGPT end up, because of an error, doing something wrong that was influenced by ChatGPT? Malpractice. How will professional liability insurance, malpractice insurance, insurance react to mistakes done because a professional followed ChatGPT? Question mark there. We are still early on over here. So there are risks around malpractice also. And, uh, but I, I really want to, to focus a lot on the trust and safety question for the, for the audience to think about. Um, for now, Geraldine. Yes. Okay. Maybe the one other risk I want to add is a fairly obvious one, which is the more we increase our dependence on these things, there's a risk that we actually atrophy our skills at independent critical thinking and creative thinking. Now, this is not such an issue at the MBA or the PhD level because our students are mature. But I'm actually a bit sympathetic to, sympathetic to the idea of controlled usage of chat GPT-like technologies in high schools. I know that makes me sound a bit like a Luddite, but I do think there is a concern here. It's a bit like you know uh, using a, a GPS to navigate. We certainly become worse at navigation. So there's an age yes. at which that doesn't matter, and there's an age at which it matters. I have, to, I have to decide whether my first year students are allowed to use it for their take home ex well for their for their exam here in the in the spring. I haven't really decided. I would always go for using technology because we don't know the second order effects, which can be positive if we manage it properly. So I think it's a question of management properly properly than not using. Uh, but again, I'm an optimist here. So on Is average, we're having a program funnies. So we're talking about management and regulation. Mm -hmm. Um, so quite recently, OpenAI actually published a blog, and in it, it says it is our belief that technology companies must be accountable for producing policies that stand up to scrutiny. So is this enough? Do we need measures to ensure ethical and responsible use of technologies such as ChatGPT? Um, tell us what do you think? First of all, absolutely. Uh, but again, what's fascinating about ChatGPT, oh. I'm going back to what I was um, talking about working in this days on, is that regulations already are out, for example, the European EU Digital Services Act that has to do with online trust and safety and content moderation is already out this year. It was, it's already in practice for some online, uh, very large online platforms and search engines. Yet the regulation is already a step behind technology. So ChatGPT is already outside the regulations that just came out. I'll give you an example. Currently regarding online trust and safety and um, content moderation, online platforms and search engines, Google, Facebook, you name it, right? games are have to do put in place content moderation and they can, and they cannot if they use chat gpt they will be liable for misinformation or bad content from chat gpt however if open ai gives access to chat gpt open ai is not a platform so open, open ai is not liable so this is strange there's a gap in the regulation if i use if i enter if i use chat gpt on google or or microsoft microsoft is liable if i use chat gpt on open ai open ai is not liable What's fascinating is how fast technology runs relative to regulation. Second thing regarding the AI regulations. The EU AI regulations, again, I'm focusing on the EU, but also other countries, also other jurisdictions, um, talks about high-risk applications of AI versus medium and low-risk applications, like you know, HR, credit, you name it, right? But it does not talk about high-risk foundation models because foundation model is not an application. It's a, it's a model. It's a platform. However, how do we regulate a foundation model that is used downstream for downstream products all over the, in different applications? What's interesting here is that at the end of the day, in the next foreseeable future, five years, maybe 10 years, we will probably have a dozen of such foundation models. You know, the big tech companies will come up with them, right? So eventually the whole world will be using a dozen common models, which are fine-tuned. This creates a very important single point of failure. Well, if these models fail, everything fails. And how do we regulate that? And should we make that big tech companies liable for this? Of course not, because then there will be no innovation. How do we manage it? We don't know. It's not going so to the how business. I, but, uh, oh, go on, sir. Sure, actually, go on, Martin, because I want to add some points on the business side. 
no, it's just so so I understand your sentiment. I just I can almost not imagine a world in which AI regulation will actually be able to keep up with the technological change. So I imagine that a year from now when we might change the regulation, then we're going to then there's going to be some other story in which there's a lag in the regulation. Yeah, so I, I yes, yeah, I, I appreciate the sentiment. I'm just less optimistic about uh, useful regulation mm -hmm. than uh, than I think you are. But what's well, the counterfactual? I mean, regulation, even if imperfect, is better than no regulation. Right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, not in general, but hopefully here. Sorry. Not in general. It's not 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 as a general statement that some oh, okay. regulation is okay. better than no regulation. But but but, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but uh but uh but but probably here, yes. However, it's interesting. But what's fascinating is that now the speed with which technology is developing is so big that literally the day the DSA came out. There's technology that goes beyond the DSA, Digital Service yeah. Act regulation. Now, inside the companies now, going, let's go a little bit inside the company. Um, I mentioned this before briefly, but I think it's important to consider this. Companies will need to put in place guidelines about who, when, and how can use ChatGPT. Because also, potentially, the, the liability risks that I mentioned before, especially for professionals. Second thing, there is a lot of talk about transparency, meaning that we have to know that something was generated by ChatGPT and there are uh, suggestions to put a watermark or something. Very difficult, very, very difficult. So I can cut and paste a ChatGPT answer that has a watermark, edit it a bit and use it, right? Second, third thing, what matters here is the impact of technology, the output of ChatGPT in this case, on human decision making. And that's very subtle. Of course, one can say any data can affect human decision making. You know, if I give you the forecast of sales, it will affect your business decisions going forward, right? But here, I think we are talking about a different type of impact on human decision making, which can create further overconfidence on unreliable information, narrative fallacies, as we call in the article I mentioned in Science Magazine, where we make up stories in your head influenced by the stories ChatGPT tells you. And you can imagine this has other implications about your behavior and decisions going forward as a business person. So we have to put in place processes and practices for that. And finally, I believe in general, and that's a general statement about AI, the most critical part, in my view, of managing AI risks in general is that we put the humans in the driver's seat in order to monitor the behavior of AI. You cannot be sure ex ante how something will work. You can only control it ex post by having monitoring processes Exactly like, and I'm going back to the online trust and safety part, exactly like how the regulators talk about ex post content moderation, where people are notifying online platforms about potentially illegal content and products. Same here. I know the OECD is already building a database of AI incidences, and I know countries of the OECD countries, governments are interested already in building those kind of databases of AI incidences for their countries. So we're going to see going forward monitoring processes regarding AI behavior, ex post. And um, maybe- Better deal, back to you. There seem to be a lot of interesting questions in the- Yes. yes. As well. What okay. would you like us to do? Um, so there is a question about, okay, more interest in the opportunities and the opportunities than the challenges. So let's talk about opportunities. Um, what do you see as the three to five um, most value added business case for ChatGPT? Can I um, can I make a sort of a society wide one before uh, before yeah, my yeah. fellow uh, panelists talk about the um, talk about business in particular? Mm -hmm. So uh, innovation or technological progress comes from innovation. It comes from sort of fundamental foundational research, and then it comes from corporate research afterwards and developing the products and so on. And that's a huge bottleneck. So there are a few people who are very good at doing these things, sort of the the Einsteins and the uh, and the Bezos of uh, of the world. The higher the extent which these type of artificial intelligence systems can help us actually do the research, then you can end up in sort of the utopia that Teos was talking about, where innovation starts happening faster and faster instead of these uh, one and a half or two percent that I, I was talking about before. We don't yet know the extent to which that's going to happen. Uh, 
uh, AI is already helping us a little bit. But for instance, in biomedical research and so on, there are various problems, say protein folding, which was a very difficult problem. It took a PhD student, their entire PhD, to figure out how one particular protein folds. And now there are AI systems who can do this almost entirely reliably uh, in a matter of hours. So there are certain areas in fundamental research and hopefully also in business research where AI can help and can potentially really push out the innovation technological frontier. So that I'm that I'm cautiously optimistic about uh, is going to be uh, is going to be a change over the coming decades. Thank you, Martin. Um, so back to the question on business value um, and opportunities. Um, Fanish, would you like to go first? Uh, so I'd mentioned earlier a bunch of functions where things like uh, copy generation, summarization, text generation, responses to conversations, looking through documents. I'm not going to report those. Those are obvious. I do want to say in general, we want to think about this technology as a way to leverage human creativity. And by that, I just don't mean art. I mean things like business plans, business models, advertising content, all of that, right? And I want to be very specific in how that works. So I've done this myself now, right? So what I would do is, for instance, I have an idea for an article I want to write. And I know the structure of that article. I think it's going to have these five paragraphs is what it's going to do. I can use something like a large language model to generate lots of alternatives. Okay, because in the end, creativity is searched through a very large space. And these algorithms can be quite good at creating large spaces and moving through them. But ultimately, only we can judge if the point it lands on is actually good. So I kind of specialize in the evaluation and I let the algorithm help me in the generation of ideas, right? So this is one way in which I think we can do some leveraging of creativity regardless of the context, whether it's academic writing or business copywriting or whatever. There are other variants on this, which I'm sure Theos can also talk about. Theos? Yeah, absolutely. I will only add one general point here. Um, I somehow had a gut feeling, and interestingly enough, uh, there is an article just written in the Wall Street Journal, I think last week, by the authors of this really nice book. Maybe some of you have The Age of AI by Henry Kissinger, Eric Schmidt, and Daniel Hutelnocher. Eric Schmidt, the Google, Henry Kissinger, the non Henry Kissinger, and Daniel Hutelnocher, the MIT head of uh, MIT School of Computing. And they just wrote the three of them again, an article last week regarding ChatGPT and relating this to the printing press. The one way to think about ChatGPT is the following. The printing press allowed us to print human-generated knowledge. ChatGPT allows us to print kind of alien knowledge. Let me give an example of this. My favorite application of ChatGPT and my favorite use of ChatGPT is in asking ChatGPT to generate versions of a document from different perspectives. For example, here is something you can all do. Take the mission statement of a company, your company, and ask ChatGPT, can you summarize the mission statement, the text, into five words in a cynical way, in a way the European would see it, in a, a way a woman would see it, in a way a man would see it, a way a kid would see it, a way an Asian would see it, a way, you know, Einstein would see it. And you will get different perspectives of the same text from imaginary characters. It's interesting to also go back to historical figures, how Napoleon would see it, right, in five, five words. It's amazing what it does. It actually helps us enlarge our understanding and perspective, which relates to creativity. And in, I, it's not, it's not, I think it's not an overstatement to say that this is the printing press of imaginary thinking beyond human imagination in some ways. And that's one way to think about this. And I highly encourage you to take a look at the article of uh, Henry Kissinger, Eric Smith, and Daniel Hutter not here last week, I think. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Theus. All right. Um, so we have a very highly voted up question. The question is, are we going to have different AI cultures say in US, Europe, and China? So are there geographical differences? I can take this one if you like. I wrote an article about this in Lancet Digital Health two years ago. It's about, um, the, you know, it started from the European EU AI Act and EU AI strategy, which starts by saying, we have to make sure we have AI with European values. And the question is, can you really have AI with European values? when you import AI trained on non-European values generated data, or you export AI to cultures which are not having the same values. And the values is in the data used to train the AI. Therefore, if values are different across different cultures, forget about having the same AI culture across different regions. Uh, it depends, of course, what you mean by culture. Second, th second topic is, and I'm working on an article like this as we speak. It will come out, I think, in April with my wonderful colleague, Ludo van der Heyden, many of you may know. 
to work together on the topic of governance, technology governance. And, um, and the, the next article we are working on has to do with China versus Europe versus the US regarding AI digital regulations more broadly. And the main argument, just to give you an intro to the, what's coming out, is that even if regulations are the same across regions, because of different value systems, which has to do with how things are implemented, the end result will be very different. And this has various other implications. You will see in the article that will come out sometime in April. But I think it's a fascinating question. I mean, already in data access, there are such huge differences, right? What we consider acceptable use of data varies so much, right? So I teach both here and in France and occasionally in other parts of Asia and India. And I teach data analytics on people data. And what we can and cannot do just is completely different in these different domains, which means just foundationally, there will be differences in data culture and therefore in yep. AI culture. Thank you. Um, and then... One question on accountability. Should mm. ChatGPT not quote the source that is being used? Otherwise, it is a black hole. So typically in a Google search, you see where's the source of the information, but with ChatGPT, you do not get that. Is that a danger zone? I mean, the Bing integration is doing that. So Bing is actually quite careful about listing sources and stuff. So eventually, once it becomes a proper productized search engine, I think it will have that. Right now, if you go to the OpenAI website, I would not trust anything that I don't already know to be true. I don't, I'm, I'm afraid I might get sued by them for saying more, but I think it's actually true. I think it's a great copy editor, good translator, search engine, not so much. And then, so, so there are certain facts where, for instance, the Bing system, where it might have that from a certain website, like when was Napoleon born? It has that from Wikipedia, period. But sort of the general sense of what Theos was talking about before, how would Napoleon view your mission statement? If you ask it about that, there will be no such thing as a particular source in which it gets that from. This is sort of a amorphous conclusion from the 175 billion parameters that it has. So there'll yeah. be some things where it's possible to tell it what the source is, and there will be some things where that's just what the billions of parameters are saying. Yeah, and, and I don't think uh, Theos wants us to believe that that's exactly what Napoleon would have said. It's basically a variance <laughs> generator, right? That's it. It generates yeah, a bunch of variety, and then you see, right? Of course, but very interesting. That's why you overlay judgment. It's very interesting to see how, how much it sounds like Napoleon. Of yes. course, you know, you are biased and you are getting to generate, as I mentioned, narrative fallacy. It's a very important concept, narrative fallacy. Yes. Thank you. And the next question is actually also um, kind of associated with the quality of the answers. So is it possible that fake facts could be established as real facts, considering that people are the ones who feed back to GPT? Who controls this? So, so very quickly, it may go back to where we started. How does this work, right? So those who know machine learning, don't, there are these three broad classes of um, algorithms, supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement learning. And Theo's mentioned reinforcement learning. There's actually a lot of um, supervised learning in that goes into chat GPT, which is based around looking at the text of dialogue between two humans, one of whom is acting like a chatbot. And there's also a lot of reinforcement learning going on with human users actually upvoting and downvoting stuff. Now, who are those human users? If that's everybody in the world, then this risk is very strong. If you're careful about empaneling experts in particular domains, the risk goes down, right? So some strategy like that, I think, has to be at the root of it. So it's kind of weird. In one sense, this is very democratizing, but it might also be quite centralizing in the notions of who are expert and who are actually competent to train these algorithms. Uh, how would they? So they would manually go in and then increase the weight on yes. yeah okay on, so they on, are doing reinforcement like, yeah. learning on replies and kind of essentially upvoting downvoting stuff and of course we're all yeah. doing it implicitly by the length of our engagement by the thumbs up thumbs down we give on it so we are contributing yeah. to it now as well yeah. there is uh, this work on uh, uh, rlhf human feedback this is again a, a, a very fast growing community of researchers in machine learning and AI. Very recent and very fast growing. It's probably from what I hear around the big topics inside Google research, for example, and I'm sure inside every research. How to take into account human feedback in order to improve the quality where the word quality has to do again with values. And that's very difficult. And that's why what I also find fascinating, and I also mentioned early on, is that we are actually at the beginning of even, of actually dealing with the AI value alignment problem which is fascinating, it's something that I wouldn't expect this to be a discussion. I thought it was always a science fiction discussion, and at least you know, not something to discuss now. 
if not before 50 years from now, and yet we discuss about this now. There is people who are working on alignment research in machine learning community nowadays, which is amazing. Okay, okay so talking about, um, again, on, on the responses that, that's given by ChatGPT, what are the impacts of the polarizing political culture on AI? So there was a commentary today that ChatGPT is too woke. Any responses to that? <laughs> so I, I will say one thing, which is not about chat GPT. And this is why I think regulation, however imperfect, needs to do something. And I think Theos probably agrees with me on this one. I mean, look at what we've done with social media. Right? We're super optimistic that this technology is going to essentially connect everybody and there will be you know, truth and beauty everywhere. Turns out that's not true. right? And, and what we know from that experiment now is that there's a large number of people whose only connection to social life is often through online channels. And the same individuals are often very poor at being able to judge truth from falsehood. So that's a very, very at-risk segment. And I think technologies like these can really be weaponized against them. Yes. Right? So I really think we ought to be working on regulating it now rather than waiting for it to blow up. So in my mind, this is a very important risk. I don't know how to do it. Uh, maybe I have one idea, which I'll quickly mention. At a minimum, I think we should force companies to be transparent, to tell people interacting with these technologies, are they interacting with the technology or a human? That seems like a very low ask, which I'm surprised we don't enforce more often, right? Instead, we're kind of happy to let it run like a Turing test, basically, and let the customer figure out, is it a human or not? But that doesn't have to be like that. You can be transparent about it. Add something here, which again, very recent. It's a big news in my view. This is one of the most interesting things in the news regarding our topic today. It's last week, or something in the past few weeks, at least. It's ongoing. It's the first time, as far as I know, that the Supreme Court of the US is discussing as we speak the case of the use of AI on online information um, recommendations. Mm -hmm. It's a case, a famous case. You can look it up. I, I posted it actually on my LinkedIn again. I put on the on the chat um, a LinkedIn post I did last night with a bunch of links. One of them is on that one. It has to do. It's a case called Gonzalez versus Google that uh, Scott, I mean the Supreme Court of the U.S. was discussing last last week. You can see the whole. You can find online the whole discussion of the Supreme Court around this. is fascinating. The case is about um, uh, vi families of the vi of victims of the Paris terrorist attack, who basically uh, uh, sued YouTube for uh, promoting uh, uh, terrorist content through their recommendation algorithm. Now, whether we promote content through a recommendation algorithm or whether you promote uh, dangerous content through ChatGPT, it's probably not too different. They're both algorithms. One gives you a specific link; the other gives you a summary, right? And it's very interesting to see what the outcome of the Supreme Court decision will be here. My guess, and everybody's, I know, guesses is that it will actually not be against YouTube. YouTube will win the case most likely. But even if that happens, but again, we don't know. The answer will come sometime in June, I think. But even if it happens, the case is one of the first cases that opens the door to discussing the famous Section 230 of the Communication Decency Act, Decency Act back in 1996, which was basically the beginning of the Internet as we know today in many ways and relates again to regulations. So we're early on, and all to share here is a fascinating news that I highly encourage people to, to follow of the Supreme Court discussion around Gonzalez versus YouTube, versus Google, sorry, versus Google, because YouTube is Google. So I agree with uh, what, what both of them said, uh, but I mean, the market will provide, right? So in a year from now, you're gonna have a non-woke AI system that people who are then particularly interested in that can, can have. One that will say, tell you that there are two genders and not more. For sure. I'm, and I am actually pretty worried. I mean, we're already pretty uh, siloed in different informational bubbles, both on Facebook and on Twitter and so on, that as, uh, as Panish talked about, that that's just going to be even worse with this, because now I have sort of this authority, uh, authority in my life mm -hmm. that seems like it's very factual and very knowledgeable, but it's sort of twisted and tuned uh, to feed into my particular bubble. So, so in the world of sociology and organizations, right, we tend to distinguish between things which are like brute facts of nature and social facts. Okay, I want to give you a very concrete example of this. Think about the use of technologies like AI for drug discovery. So one of the nice things about drug discovery is, you know, whatever process you use to come up with a candidate molecule, in the end, it either works and cures the cancer or it doesn't. There's no ambiguity about that, right? That's what the clinical trials process is. Now think about a recommendation for an ad campaign. That's the polar opposite, because whether it works or not is heavily contingent on who you're talking to and what their mindset is and what time of the year and when. And the answers might be very, very different depending on how many other people agree that it's a good marketing campaign. 
So these are called coordination effects, right? So there's pure search, some truth out there versus things that are true because enough people think they're true. Okay. And the latter is a very large part of what we consume in terms of information about politics, about society, about attitudes, about opinions. That's where these technologies can really play a very dangerous role because they can completely inoculate you from that truth serum of what's actually true in the world. So that's the big concern here. And I don't think any of us know what's a good, good way to resolve that problem, but this is an ongoing project, I think. Let me add here some research related to this. Um, I think it was published in Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences a couple of years ago, where what the researchers did is they studied different platforms, I believe YouTube, Facebook, Reddit, and one more, I don't remember, where they had, the, one of the results was a following plot on the x-axis, you have how woke or non-woke, if I may use the questions, um, the questions language, somebody is based on what things they like. Actually, it was left and right, Democrats, Republicans, whatever. And the y-axis was how left or right, how woke or non-woke, the people do, that person interacts with mostly are. And this is impacted both by the choice of the you make about who, whom you interact with or what you like, whom, whose, whose content, content you like, but also on what the recommendation algorithms do in terms of suggesting friends or suggesting content to you. And the result shows that, for example, I believe, maybe I confuse now the, the websites, I think um, Reddit was the one where basically it doesn't matter what you are and who you are, more or less you mix with everybody. And I think another platform, I don't remember which one, let me not give him here misinformation, showed a very clear difference of two uh, blobs. One blob was walks, interact with walks and walk content, non-walks, interact with non-walks and non-walk content. And the question is, and part of the research question was there, what was the role of the recommendation algorithms? on creating these uh, filter bubbles, information bubbles, as I said, versus not. We don't know yet. It's very difficult to even uh, manage those algorithms in order not to create this kind of bubbles. There's a lot of work on this for the past 20 years, actually, going all the way back to recommender systems for products, you know, give you the most popular product or the product which is niche. But yeah. it's an ongoing research project for decades by now, by the way. So, okay, yes. I, I think we have only time for one question before we close for today. So this one is probably from Morton. Um, considering almost 40% of the global population have no access to the internet, will chat GPT increase the range of inequality in terms of knowledge? Well, that's a good question. Um, well, in sort of a direct way, yes, in the sense that I will now be, be more easy for me to, to find the knowledge that, that is out there. But there is already an enormous disparity between people who have access to the internet and ha don't have access to the internet. So I already have all of this knowledge in Wikipedia, online, Google Scholar, and so on. ChatGPT just helps me, um, helps me find it. Uh, I will almost flip it around and look at the people who have access to the internet. Just within the group of people who have access to the internet, there is a big difference in how good people are at finding information. Like some of them are more comfortable with the internet, some are less comfortable with the internet. It might be that ChatGPT could, or something like it, could help reduce the income inequality, the uh, the information uh, inequality amongst the people who have access to the internet. But obviously, people who don't have access to the internet are not going to be directly affected by 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 these large language models. Let me add here something. I was involved in a project with the World Economic Forum last year that was about AI and inclusiveness, and one of the topics has to do with language. For example, ChatGPT is mostly trained and better actually working for English language, right? It relates to culture, by the way, a question we discussed before, right? So what does it mean for um, for uh, 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 people coming from uh, speaking languages which are less representative on our databases, whether database is internet or something else, or books or whatever it is? Yes, what does yeah. it mean? So it's very difficult to think about inclusiveness, not regarding only access to the internet or not, but even access, even popularity of a language itself on our digital databases, internet or books or something else. It's very so difficult I, to balance. Uh, so I, I played along with it. Uh, I played along with it in Danish, a language that only six million people speak, and it consistently insisted that it does not speak Danish. But then all the answers were like just as they would have been in English, but just in Danish. So it, it performed almost as well in Danish as it did in English. It could have been translation. So because yeah, it might <laughs> which which is also American, which is also very good at yes. We get the American culture in in Danish language. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Think about it. Okay, so um, we have just five minutes left and I'd like to close with a question to all our panelists. So I see there are still 65 questions. I'm very sorry you can't answer all of them. 
Um, it's a very big topic with, um, within one hour. So the question to close this session, um, going forward, what are the important problems related to AI that we need to work on? And could you briefly share on what are some of these areas you're working on? Um, Panish, would you like to start first? Uh, sure. So I'm, I'm quite interested in, in uh, uh, two ideas. One is that how can we improve the quality of human thinking with assistance from technologies like this one? Uh, we are working on this idea of uh, human AI ensembling. So in machine learning, it's very standard to build ensemble models where we combine predictions from multiple models. Uh, what does it mean when we do that where some are human and some are AI? It doesn't automatically mean, by the way, that I'm optimistic that always works. I mean, take chess, for example. In chess today, it's the case that the best player is just a machine. That's it. There's nothing the human can add. So I don't know how many fields will be like that and how many will not. That's what we're trying to understand. What are the limits and the opportunities for combining humans and AI to do better? What are some broad theoretical conditions under which that will happen? So that's probably the most relevant research I'm doing connected to this stuff. That is super optimistic. We're still in a picture. Humans are still in a picture. Thank you. Is, we're trying to identify when exactly, right? Like in chess, they no longer are. It's over. But in other games, that's not true. Yeah, great. And uh, what about you, Martin? Well, so uh, me in particular, so I think overall the most important issue here is alignment and AI, but like I am not sufficiently uh, expert on that, that I can add much to that. So what I'm trying to do is that we economists are good at looking at what happened in the past and then try to figure out how did it happen and tell a retrospective story, right? So I can tell a great story about how computers sort of increased wage polarization by replacing the mid-level accountants and the secretaries and so on. We're not as good as predicting things in the advance. And in particular, I don't presently know whether AI is going to be predominantly skill biased or low skill biased, who are the people is going to predominantly negatively affect. I do believe that it's going to increase the overall pie in the economic pie. So there will be more overall, but it's going to have negative influences on certain subsets of the group. So that's what I'm trying to do, like measure the use of automation more generally, but AI in particular, and then try to look at what are the consequences of that on local labor markets, income inequality, and so on. So that's predominantly what I'm working on in, in this space. Thank you, Martin. And Theos, you have the last word. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so in my opinion, and also a little bit of little experience, is that it's very important that um, all of us can try as much as possible to become familiar with the multiple aspects of this, of what we're talking about. And there are many, many aspects. So in that spirit, I'm trying to, I, I, I try to work with a lot of different people on a lot of different topics. And I'll give an example, because of course you learn from others, you cannot know everything. So for example, I'm working um, with philosophers and uh, legal scholars, um, I mentioned an example before, regarding regulations of AI and AI risks, which I think is very important, and also challenges regarding uh, cultural differences, as our question was. Then there is a lot of work on governance, and I mentioned the work we're doing with, um, with Ludo van der Heyden, the INSEAD colleague, on tech, uh, tech governance. And we have an article on INSEAD Knowledge that started a series of articles, which is called Good Tech which what is good tech uh, for you to read on inside knowledge. Uh, recently, we worked with, this, with about 20 other people from different universities, from Harvard, Stanford, MIT, Oxford, you name it, on an article called Computational Ethics. It's online, you can find it there. It's, that, the title says a lot, but there's a lot to be done there around computational ethics. Um, a lot around AI risk management and risk management in general. I mentioned the importance of monitoring. So we work together with uh, both legal scholars and people from pharmacovigilance Pharmacovigilance is the area where um, the regulators for pharmaceuticals, for drugs, monitor the side effects of drugs and then withdraw drugs once in a while. There is a lot of lessons to learn from that uh, um, uh, regarding monitoring and um, uh, ensuring the safety of AI in general. Finally, I started again going back to math and methods. So I'm very excited to start working with people from uh, computer science departments and, and, and uh, research labs of class companies regarding human feedback, RLHM, as I mentioned, uh, HF, sorry. And also the following question, which is, because this technology is a foundation model, companies will need to fine tune it. And training these models is, cost, is very costly. So one question is, what's the most cost efficient way, the least data, most informative data, to train and fine tune these models for multiple different applications in the spirit of what we called, in some research I was doing back in 2005, 7, 8, called multitask learning. Learn, use this to learn multiple tasks at the same time in a cost efficient way. So I'm trying to kind of work on all of those levels from regulations and philosophy to math, basically. Thank you very much, Thank you. Dios. Thank you very much, Martin and Hanish. Seems like we have lots of uh, food for thought to take away with us and also a, a huge reading list from Dios. 
Um, so thank you very much to our panelists and thank you very much to our audience. Um, so um, with this, we thank you for joining us today and uh, just like to share that the recording will be shared on our website. Please visit Digital at INSEAD website for more information on upcoming webinars. And we hope to see you again soon. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>